Me from Hong Kong, China. Benny Long, the founder of Social Innovations Hub from Singapore. Nguyễn Quang Mong, chairman of Hong Kong, Vietnam. Chris Day, founder and CEO of Dream AOD International from China. And our session today will be moderated by Sunit Nguri, resident trainer of TCS China. And now the stage is yours. Thank you. Subject, uh, which is uh, very important and it's very important now. Uh, Tata Consultancy Services is a global technology services company. It's been around for about 25 years. Uh, originally headquartered in India, but now we have operated in more than 50 countries. Our annual revenues are about $28 billion and a market cap of between 170 uh, billion to 180 billion. Uh, of, uh, <coughs> We provide technology services to more than uh, 1,500 companies. We help them leverage technology to meet their business goals. And of course, uh, sustainability and ESG is a critical tenet of our uh, strategy. As an organization, uh, there are four areas that we typically uh, work with. Of course, first is our own agenda and race to net zero. And we have very, very strict uh, targets that we uh, work towards as a business have the advantage of having uh, solid technology uh, understanding and backing, so that helps us. Uh, second is, of course, we work with uh, our clients to help them meet their this, uh, ESG agendas. And we, as you know, technology is now playing a very critical and crucial role uh, in, in any kind of innovation. And of course, uh, when it comes to ESG, it's, it's the same. Uh, so obviously, technology is being good. The third area is our uh, employee base. TCS has close to 100, uh, 600,000 employees. Uh, incidentally, 200,000 we are really, really proud of. And we work very closely with our employees also across the world to uh, A, leverage them as a powerhouse and help them contribute to society. And the fourth and very critical area is that we work with young minds, which is in schools. So we are closely associated with uh, several programs across the world in whichever market that we have, where we work with schools and work with uh, students to A, uh, highlight the criticality of uh, sustainability and be able to be uh, a positive contributor and also uh, be comfortable with technology because going forward, uh, you know, there is technology can be leveraged to solve a lot of, is being used and can be used to solve a lot of problems. Uh, with that, uh, it is my pleasure uh, and privilege to moderate this uh, panel. This panel is uh, comprises of very senior leaders who have very diverse uh, experience, and that is something I'm really excited about. Uh, they come from. We have two founders on this panel. Um, three actually. Uh, they have worked across uh, industries. Um, FMCG. Uh, we have uh, people who, we, we have uh, uh, Penny who has been a member of parliament in addition to being a financial uh, wizard. Uh, we have Bill whose company is uh, is actually living this every day as he advises companies. Uh, we have Bonnie who works with, uh, who is who set up a foundation in uh, uh, social enterprise in Hong Kong to work with her. So very, very diverse things, of course we have this uh, this is the one who's, uh, the, who's again a founder and has also outcome, which is based in uh, Hanoi. And uh, they are also uh, big time investors and also advise companies on how to kind of uh, deal with um, sustainability. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, over the next uh, uh, maybe 12 15 minutes, what I would request is uh, all the participants and panel members, because I obviously have not done justice to their back extensive backgrounds and their organization. What I would do is request with them is to maybe introduce themselves and uh, their uh, organization and um, and then we take it from there. So if I could request, maybe start from Chris, if I could request you to introduce yourself and your 
Oh, uh, sure. Uh, I'm going to take it from there. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris, and uh, I'm Singaporean. Actually, I've been living in China for the last 24 years. Uh, I kind of crossed the industry, so I, my first start, I went to start all my life. Uh, my first start was in technology, I did for 12 years, and I sold a company, and that's the reason why I went to China, uh, based in Shanghai. Uh, but I did not live in Shanghai for many years. I tried to live mostly in all other parts of the world, uh, of, of, the, of the country, in Northeast, uh, Northwest, uh, even I spent almost in Tibet. Uh, and when I was working for them, I went to join a very pretty large action company. Uh, most people who have lived in uh, China would know the brand called Mastercard. Uh, I was in charge of that brand and we made uh, instant noodles, water, tea, uh, all sorts of SDG stuff. Uh, it's a pretty big company. I got bored and I went to uh, work for a state owned company, uh, which uh, first wanted to work for a milk company called Ely, and I was the GM then. And I decided to uh, embark on my own after that. So currently I'm the uh, founder and CEO of a very, very small company. I like small companies and we do uh, healthy drinks. Uh, we are ESG and we do it, I wouldn't say 100%, because it's a, a very, uh, it's, it's a, it's a long term thing, it's not a one day or two day thing can get it done. Um, anyway, so that's pretty much my company. Uh, we have uh, investors that are very industry friendly, uh, or more or less they are pushing towards that direction. Um, so we'll talk more about this later on about the challenges that we face uh, you know, in the market, not just in China but also as a whole uh, in Asia Pacific. Yeah, thank you. I am uh, from Vietnam and actually uh, as I just mentioned earlier that I'm the sort of founder, I created uh, this company, Hong Kong company, mainly based in Hanoi. Uh, almost for 23 years ago, and we also have uh, some uh, subsidiary, uh, some other provinces in, uh, in Vietnam. And we focus on uh, renewable energy, water supply, sanitation, solid waste management, all kind of related to the green development actually at the beginning and, and so far. And uh, this subject today is very interesting for us actually. Um, we, we also, I mean, uh, the company in Hong Kong also just focus on the sustainable development, but the GESG is quite a new uh, term, uh, especially for the governance. Uh, nowadays, many people are talking about ESG, but uh, what's really uh, meaningful and uh, how, how to get it done and so on, and I think that's still the challenge. Not only, I don't think it's not only for Vietnam, but also for some other European countries, especially in Asia. Then um, maybe if you discuss something, I should learn something from you uh, too. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Moni from Hong Kong. And it's a pleasure to be here again in this hall after the COVID time since 2018. I'm the founder and executive director of Social Enterprise Research Academy and why we found this academy is basically based on the insights since 2014 when Hong Kong governments started the consultation period for whether to implement the ESG reporting from consultation to become mandatory now. So this is how we see the growth, the potential of ESG markets in Hong Kong and we started this Social Enterprise Research Academy. So in the past 10 years, like time flies for 10 years, so we have been extended our influence to 13 cities uh, so as to promote sustainable communities in different parts of the world. And we want to foster a, this community to bring in a cross-industry talent tank that can actually bring elites from different industries, from business, from academia, as well as from political side and social like NGOs together to have more communications on our platform. So we hope to, we see the importance of you know, industrial leaders and on how they can actually influence the community in terms of uh, the position and their uh, corporate culture. So we have been focusing on top management training over the years, especially through ESG online courses. 
So I uh, hope to introduce more later through our uh, sharing. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, it's been uh, a long day for some of you. So I uh, appreciate you being here. But most of all, thank you, Frank, uh, for bringing you know, Horizons uh, to this part of the world and also bringing us all here together to meet again. Um, my name is Penny, Penny Lowe. I've been a uh, member of parliament uh, for just under 15 years in Singapore, during which time you know, I had oversight of many ministries, including the Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Trade Industry for about nine years, and uh, the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources, which is now transformed into the Ministry of Sustainability for about six years, uh, also the Ministry of uh, Information Communications and the Arts, uh, which is now also called the Ministry of Communication and Information for over 13 years. So um, in, in all of those years, you know, I also took the chance or the opportunity to build uh, the first echo town in Singapore, as well as in the tropics. Uh, the town has grown, you know, from that of just about 2,000 households to now, you know, um, pushing towards 70,000 households. Uh, and will grow to become the largest um, township in Singapore uh, in a few years' time. Uh, it's also fast becoming the first digital district, which has an ambition to generate some 28,000 jobs um, out of the open data and infrastructure that are laid in place. Um, but since, you know, stepping back from politics, uh, I have also been helping to build, to mentor um, C-suites, um, and one of the C-suites which I've spent a lot of time uh, on is actually uh, somebody who was the president of an uh, innovation institute agency or innovation agency in China um, and we grew it from having about 23 research technology research institute to having now more than 100 research institute and rising to become the national innovation agency um, taking care of the technology harmonization of the entire Yangtze Delta region, which, you know, Jiangsu alone is responsible for about 24% of Chinese GDP. So this is plus plus, uh, and it's now, of course, you know, um, when they gave me the title of uh, the Chief Strategy Advisor of this agency itself, honestly, I became a little bit uncomfortable uh, since I had a political background, and uh, I also wanted to, you know, have a certain uh, neutral, um, um, a certain neutrality in the international arena, which is my playground. Uh, I've stepped back, you know, away from that role. Also, actually, the real reason is because I'm very much into mindfulness. How we can use, you know, mindfulness to promote a better world and leadership for greater good. Thank you, Penny. In fact, I attended Penny's session earlier, and I'm going to come back to that uh, part a little later because that requires a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, comment section or commentary on that. So we come back to that. Please sure. Thank you. We'll be back. Yes. Right. Thanks, uh, thanks, friend, for the invitation. Uh, this is Bill Kong. I'm from Shanghai. I'm uh, founder and CEO of Eco Environmental. Uh, we are providing kind of like uh, supporting business to innovate, to transform from old practice into sustainability uh, using informed decision based on science and data. Um, so companies, if they have questions regarding how their product can meet the environmental demand, uh, sustainable demand from market like European countries, like Americans or other countries, or companies who have trouble with carbon print, organizational or product level, uh, if they have a difficulty to integrate a digital information or create a platform tools to engage with their supply chain, all companies have trouble to integrate NGOs or society or you know, community. We are kind of usually talk with them and then we are creating through our 15 years of uh, experience uh, with Ecoven, the platform. Uh, so we're building this bridge and dialogue helping um, refine their strategy and uh, their tool, the capacity. So I'm glad to be here and uh, we, uh, we will be sharing much more um, after this. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, I'll come back to you. Uh, uh, you're a, uh, a 
as a founder uh, of a successful software company, you're, you mentioned you are also uh, exporting to the region. Right? So there are two aspects that I would like you to touch upon. The first is, uh, as you know, uh, we, we, uh, one is how easy or tough is it to cross borders? You know? Because uh, different countries have different standards, and Asia has a mix of countries. That's one part. The second part is uh, how does one convince folks internally in the company, which is the shareholders, the investors, that ESG is a good thing, and also the customers to pay a little more. So I think these are the two aspects that I would like to kind of touch upon, uh, uh, Chris, given your extensive understanding of this. Uh, that, that, that's a tough question to answer, actually. <laughs> It's very broad because uh, you're right, every country has a different kind of standard. I would say standard, I think they all have pretty much the same standard, but they have different kind of expectations, right? So especially after post-COVID and uh, when China opened up last, literally last year, uh, let's say in Vietnam, for example, we're selling Vietnam already. Uh, fortunately and unfortunately that the customers that I have here, uh, they don't ask for ESG compliance. Uh, internally, we have no problem. My like shareholders, and my team, and I, we are very pro ESG. Uh, it's not just a slogan, it's not just shouting a slogan, where it's just friendly, but you have to make sure that even the factories in uh, China can try their best to comply as much as possible. It's not 100%, right? Uh, in Vietnam, uh, the customers that we have right here, they care more about the price. Right? I mean, that's understandable because we are an FSG. And uh, so we try uh, to explain that to them that uh, we are ESG friendly and it's not just about environmental, social, and governance. Uh, well, one of our customers here, I will not name, uh, is a Japanese group. Uh, they are much more uh, pro, uh, in that really help a bit. Um, but the rest, um, they are a bit more, say, let's wait and see here, you know. Like in Thailand, uh, on the other hand, because the ingredients, the ingredients that we use to make it uh, less sweet or uh, sugarless, uh, they are a plant that is very, very uh, environmentally friendly, right? Um, but unfortunately, like when good Thailand, uh, the taste has to be adjusted to be much more sweeter. So basically, they're going for sugar, right? So that's against what we do. But to comply uh, with the market uh, expectation demand, because it's a, it's a big customer, uh, we have to compromise with uh, maybe the, 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 the bottles that we use is more uh, biodegradable, but uh, the liquid that we use, uh, we have to uh, unfortunately have to reduce the, uh, the plant that we use and use more sugar. And likewise, with Cambodia and Indonesia, and now we're looking at Turkey as well. And Turkey, they like very, very sweet stuff. <laughs> so you, you can't really convince them to do that. So it's a challenge uh, in terms of. Uh, Translating what you want to do into, into the market. Thank you. Uh, carrying on with this point, now, you've been uh, a successful founder and obviously you've been advising from investing from, uh, from your perspective, but you have a different lens that you look at it. Uh, how do you, uh, what kind of challenges do you foresee and what are the couple of things that you would advise uh, companies to do uh, to? Uh, so that it's a win-win situation for him. Uh, what would be your guidance? Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the uh, Hanfamix channel mostly focus on green development. So we don't get any problem with the environmental impact assessments or maybe social safeguard and so on. But actually, there are all things that we have to consider that uh, the growth, like uh, uh, the loan, how to pay back, and still keep the less impact to the people, especially when we uh, uh, get the resettlement action plan, then the people lost, lost uh, their land, and how to uh, rehabilitate their life, and also many kind of things. Uh, Possibly it's not uncommon, but we work quite a long time, almost for 20 years, or more than 20 years with the World Bank and ADB and, and, and such type of organizations. So that goes sustainable development, more or less, we get familiar with that. But 
but for the co another company like, like also Lisa's mentioned earlier that uh, really challenged for them because if they uh, uh, commit to produce green products they have to pay more for environment they have to pay more for social support they have to pay more for some other issues even if following strictly the law uh, security whatever why the price they cannot compete with another competitor so I think that's always going to be a challenge for, for them another another thing that um, also a difficulty for the, some small company like uh, the technology the technology normally they just apply for very backward one and they cannot save energy they cannot save the uh, equipment, the uh, harm, the labor costs, and so on. That also increases to the cost of the products. And then, the first one, I think that uh, also that uh, for the financial resources, for the small company, how can they can approach for that? Many, many people are talking about the Greek development fund, and for a small company, how to get it? That's all the way in the paper, newspaper. We can, read, we can see everywhere in the newspaper, green development fund and so on. But actually, for a company, when they up, up, apply for that, it's not easy. And without the financial support, I think that's quite difficult for a small company to get their ESG in, the, in the, the development in their organization, especially uh, for the management uh, skill. I mean, International skill is not uh, familiar with them and how to how to make the people here uh, in Vietnam or some other developing country get a familiar with the management uh, methods of the international one and in another developing country. So that's one of the challenges for the nation. Thank you. Thank you. What do you uh, your you set up a, a social enterprise uh, and you are. Uh, it's, it's quite unique uh, platform that you have set up where you advise white leaders and also advise. So, you know, from your perspective, uh, there are a couple of things that I would like you to share with the group is what are the trends that you're seeing uh, you know, from Hong Kong, you know, point of view? The second is what are the strategies that you have uh, put in place over the last couple of years which are, you think are working? Know, where some of us can uh, try and see if we can deploy them in our markets. I think these are the two things that are the nice ways to talk about. Like, I, I think in the past 10 years, Hong Kong has been improving a lot with the ESG practices, as well as Hong Kong government has always been pushing a lot of different policy measures. For example, there's a platform for carbon credit trading now. For core climate, and there's also some other green finance schemes for enabling more green finance products to be launched in the market. But this is also because why we're having this this uh, new measures are basically because institutional investors are much more uh, concerned about ESG factors in these products uh, as they do investment decisions. So this is. This is why there is there comes to be such a change, in, and also with all these measures in launching in the financial market. But I, I think more importantly is how the regulatory side has been changing the landscape, because in Hong Kong the stock exchange has been like tightening the focus on um, maybe on the board composition. There there's a new policy launch. There will be it will be have more uh, requirements of female directors on the board, like thirty percent by this year. So there will be more female directors uprising in Hong Kong, like uh, more than before. And also there will be um, they will bring a lot of changes to the corporate culture as well, because before there will be no no such lot of opportunities for female, but now become a more inclusive and more diverse perspective, purpose perspective in their decision as well as the 
culture, and this is also indirectly affecting the society, and it will be more uh, inclusive uh, and more diverse as well in our in our whole community. So I think, uh, to a certain extent, how the capital market change would also be affecting how our society change as well. So uh, this is the recent change in Hong Kong. And for our organization, however we see there's a gap in between um, the operation side and you know the direction side, the, the gap is basically because uh, we, uh, we want to implement all these new measures, but then that does not mean that you know the execution level can actually like, match with the, the, the new initiative. For example, uh, there's this waste reduction program launching in overall Hong Kong in the coming time that we have to charge when we throw maybe some garbage or some waste. But then the public is not yet there, you know, they, they are not yet reaching a, a shared value. That is what we always talk about creating shared value in ESG, but then that, that means we need more education and how we come to a consensus. Like, why we need to do this and how to do this. So between the gap, we're trying to um, to improve it through top management education, and we got this very very short uh, course launch on online, so that uh, more people can, more management or stakeholders like investors can quickly catch the idea of ESG management standard or how actually ESG can be integrated in the operation level before we only talk about reporting and like only output, but there's never input in the, in the entire company system. So we're providing this online training so that we go handy. We also got this round table conferences as well as uh, maybe regular, we have regular gatherings in like physical gatherings as well. So as we will, we will partner with different uh, important stakeholders such as uh, government bodies or uh, different NGOs and uh, maybe some research bodies so as to share their findings. And we also notice one very important thing is even we do corporate management training online, um, it does not mean that you know these are hard knowledge, but ESG is actually something that is a, in a momentum way. It's, it's very practical, it involves different industries, that is what Chris mentioned, and it is very, very diverse, uh, different standards as you mentioned. And how can we actually uh, catch up with this trend? Like, the knowledge is not like hard knowledge, it's actually soft knowledge. So that's why we have to we have to regularly host some webinar online and to enable our like like students to continue continuous learning. That's what we call it. Yeah. So these are strategies. Education, uh, knowledge sharing, and top down making sure the leaders know yes. uh, and then also creating a good strong platform for sharing because it's a dynamic situation. Yes, and what the, yeah, and I also remember there's one very important thing is how we motivate the leaders through awards. We got we got two awards program. One is through a fellowship program. It is for selecting the best, let me call CSR leaders in different industries together as our fellows. And there's another one is for corporate, that is for the social care and patrol work program. So these two motivational programs are what help us to gather leaders around to, to join the platform and they will continue to do good as well. Awards for the leaders and awards for the company. Good, good point. Now, <coughs> coming to uh, Benny, Benny, you've, you've done many, many hats. Many, many hats. Um, and you had, you know, been able to kind of have a view on policy creation, uh, implementing those policies, uh, you know, a, and, and now more recently of creating a social platform. So I would really you know, seek your guidance and input on how do you make it, how do you pay, for example, how do you encourage, how do you get more investments uh, in, uh, into platforms uh, such as yourselves who, uh, so that you know, you're, you're spending the right kind of awareness and how does uh, creating the right policy environment make an impact? So maybe you know, 
ask you to touch upon this thing and really leveraging your diverse background, uh, you know, uh, experience to kind of articulate some of this policies, make it easier for some of us. Thank you, Sunit. You have asked a, a question that I would spend about three months and three days, you know, to share. But uh, it's, a, it's a very important question. And I think, you know, the simple answer is, I think first, uh, as somebody who is aware and concerned about Mother Earth and about leaving a better planet than when we first came to Earth itself, um, I think the first thing is to be a human and to be a person. And when I say that, you know, what I'm also saying is, therefore, it's not about, it's not just about the role that I play as a member of parliament, not just as a mover and shaker of the social enterprise scene in Singapore and beyond, not just as a strategy advisor for technology search firms, you know, but really just as a person, what is it that, you know, I stand for? You know, what is it that defines me and my DNA? And when I go out there, how do people, you know, recognize me and associate me with? And I think, you know, that's the very first step. Um, therefore, when I was in the parliament, then I spoke, I think, for the, I was there for about close to 15 years. And so for the first five years, I was covering mainly financial topics. But when I discovered this gem called social enterprise, and ESG, I became an advocate and almost every other, if not every speech in the parliament is actually about promoting ESG, promoting social entrepreneurship, um, because I then understood the power of regulatory framework. So the first thing is, you know, when you're in that position itself, it's important to also speak, I think, uh, not speak, but to be an authentic leader, right, and speak about what you believe in. So the first thing was, you know, okay, you know, let's let's look at the regulatory framework because the regulatory framework gives either incentives or disincentives to businesses, right, and it that incentivizes the kind of business behavior as well as consumer behavior. So. If we're able to then, you know, get a sense of what the regulatory framework is about and can do, we can then go about, you know, uh, seeking experts' advice, getting, you know, ready, you know, uh, companies, ready NPOs, social enterprises, and all around to try and form, you know, an expert panel on how some of the ESG methods or social enterprise at a point in time, you know, could actually come together to strengthen policy frameworks. So it's not about, you know, um, just overturning what is there. It's about coming together to strengthen it because ESG matter in particular, you need all hands on that. It's not a matter for social enterprises to tackle alone. It's not a matter for just government to lay down the regulatory framework. It's actually for all sectors, especially the private sector, to also put in the leadership to shape it, and of course for the consumers, which is these days very powerful with social media, uh, to also uh, request for it. So, so as a as a uh, elected member of parliament, that was one of the first things that you know I could do uh, within the parliament the house itself. But also then when I went out there to shape my own constituency and the new town, you know. Again, I'm calling the experts from the World Economic Forum, uh, from you know some of the green um, advocates to come together to say, now we have this new town, how do we build it? And we sought the, um, not just opinions, but even the consensus of our residents, which is a very arduous process, because you might as well decide and then you can make easier, right? But then it won't be loved by everyone, right? But when you get the ground to come together, we championed something and they really fought for it, it was that start to get a sense of belonging, a sense of ownership, and the stick, they feel like a stick, a real stakeholder, right? And they actually protect it. 
And that is how, in fact, the story of Congo uh, Green Town evolved to become an award-winning Green Town and a role model, um, not just for Singapore, but also for um, countries that are developing and coming to Singapore to learn. Um, and of course, you know, in the realm of um, being in the technology uh, research uh, arena, one of the things I wanted to do, so we, we had institutes, we started with institutes that, that are very, very technical. So for example, Institute of Advanced Polygon. You know, but towards the end of my um, um, engagement with them, we were starting Institute of Water Policy, Clean Water, you know, Institute of for the Elderly. So things that can relate to us a lot more, so that you know when people feel for it, so it's not just banana, you know, but it's something which we can feel for it, we know that it relates to our humanity, to our survival, I think it, it's easier to persuade people to do so. Thank you. I think for me, the key thing is first of all, individual credibility, uh, walk the talk, uh, there, and I think build consensus across stakeholders. I think those are the three clear, uh, I think, takeaways that I've taken in hearing from you. Uh, that it's very important to get uh, a diverse set of stakeholders involved to build consensus, which obviously is not easy, but at least that's, that kind of helps this is the journey. I think coming to you, uh, thank you, thank you, Bill. Coming to you, Bill, uh, you, uh, you know, so every, you know, different uh, organi different regions, different countries have different standards, right? And you work with organizations as they, uh, Chinese organizations as they go global, you know, so Standards are different in Europe, standards are different in North America. How do you help or, or, or how do you make it easier for companies to adapt to a different standard uh, than their home country? Um, some of that maybe if you could uh, touch upon uh, uh, you know, a couple of examples of how uh, you help them uh, go overseas or adapt to a different standard. You know, this is a very profound question. I think, uh, I would, to be, I think better understand it uh, or uh, to respond to the question, I want to uh, share with you my conversation with friend about the meaning of the crisis. Um, Frank told me it is a, it's a philosophical meaning, uh, a word from Greek, right? It's about the perspective, but it's, it's a method, it's a global vision. Uh, so coming back to the, the word crisis, I also think about the Chinese word, about the corresponding Chinese word for this same uh, Greek meaning, Greek word. I found it in uh, the book of Bright, um, in the record of learning, uh, so it's called the uh, uh, Liji. And you have, you have a meaning called the Boya. So you have broad understanding and you have profound, you know, the royal um, moral, uh, this kind of uh, understanding of of insight. So uh, back to the question you asked. So um, when we provide service or pro collaborate with business, uh, we are not only providing a support of consultancy from uh, certification or provide an instant grant of access to the market by providing certification. This is, this is on our level for the, uh, I, I, should, I should cite again the Dr. Jin, there's a four word for that. Uh, you, are, you are talking from the topics, which is Tao. I believe this is also what can you talk about. The right way to do the right direction. I mean, choose the right direction for doing business, which is sustainability, which is global, you know, uh, community. Um, and then you go to the second level, which is Fa. Fa is like the law, the regulation, the policy, and how you will do things correctly, which is methodology. And in that level, we want to talk with business, we always share with them why we are doing this choosing this direction for secular economy, for eco product, for you know um, all kinds of green certification, green kind of mechanism. That is the chat we are talking about. Product is the DNA of uh, we call the renewable economy or sustainable economy. We should have a good product and good service. And then the third level is Sue. Sue in this way is for the, the detail standard. Uh, you know, regulation in a product level or, or industrial level. And that one business need analysis. We together with business to go into the so-called PCR product category rule, into the ISO standard for product, you know, carbon footprint and water footprint. So then business can't understand why and 
how the European, the American, and different market are choosing this kind of principle is my story. Based on that understanding, then we choose the last level, which is Qi. Qi in Chinese means tool. The, the capability we use, the, the kind of knowledge we should pick up from the internal company, the management, and also externally like us, we provide platform. So you can use tools like life cycle assessment, like eco design, green supply chain management. So you, this kind of tool to enhance their ability, enhance their knowledge to comply with the regulations, and then eventually we move up to the follow up the you know, the trend of direct development and also the trend of DAO, which is the principle of sustainability. I think this stay with you, uh, Bill. Now, as you know, we uh, all know that uh, supply chain, uh, while we may be an organization, we may be compliant, but we also have to ensure that our supply chains around the world are also uh, heading in the right direction. Now, being the founder of a company, uh, you have an assessment tool that you have uh, created, right? So, uh, uh, how does uh, uh, how does that help? Uh, is, is how did you think of create, first of all, how did you think of creating this tool and then what is the impact that you have seen or the benefit of this tool that uh, your organization uh, has uh, uh, your favorite has, has created? Yeah. Uh, well, two, uh, what you are talking about, uh, we, are, we are using so called digitalization or using domain technology. The goal of the tool always is to help enhance the knowledge and knowledge becomes wisdom. In that way, we can have a more informed decision, scientifically based for company, for society, eventually, eventually for the global uh, economy. Um, so what we help actually is and is to build a connection between the value of sustainability and the action, which is in Chinese, uh, English is called pragmatic decision or pragmatic behavior. But in Chinese culture, we are all students. So, Xu is the value, the world view of stability, but it's very hard to connect the value in the top to the behavior in the bottom because certainly don't always sell. I mean, like 15 years ago, we started the whole thing. No company is buying this service. We started to survive. I do a lot of training, I do a lot of free, you know, social uh, uh, education, but with this kind of uh, non profit like organization we create also with EBP China to promote the share of green product and the certification system, which create a common, you know, a fair playground for good good money to drive out the bad money, or the bad money university drive out the good money. So that effort uh, is very hard because in the beginning, value don't buy, you know, value don't sell. So, um, the reason is um, that, that, you know, strategically business always survive for creating, a uh, you know, building solutions for, for, for companies or for society. But sustainability, there's no uh, social buying power in the beginning. Uh, less uh, the, the platform we are developing right now actually want to connect all the ways to down until the so-called Qi level to uh, create a, this so-called leverage playground to encourage more policy and regulation and support the Chinese company, they want to go to Europe, they have this, they can lead the department of circular economy and green product, and they can sell better in how, to, how, they, how do they do that? Because they have to design the supply chain right now uh, in their place with the digital tool support, which the education system and the encourage from government as well as from NGO, uh, like what um, our body is providing the SDNG education. So that together, I would think it's a community empowerment to support company to develop this uh, value driven, but this, in this time the value will be sustainability, connect to the so called uh, uh, behavior level, and we build in this connection from Shibus, which is the value to action, and then we can create a momentum to go for fostering the sustainability. Excellent. I think you need to write a book also, given how you're able to connect various dots. Write a book. <laughs> Make it easier for some of us. Okay. Uh, maybe I will come on to you. I did mention I was going to ask you to touch upon uh, mindful leadership. So I think everything, any, any new initiative, uh, especially in the evolving field, leadership is critical. Right? And more and more, as we hear that uh, people who are really successful in this VUCA world are the ones who practice mindfulness. So from your perspective, so that's one aspect. The second is in terms of the 
team to craft out the right strategies uh, to make it effective. So, you know, uh, you know Singapore as a, you know, as a lived as I know is usually uh, what they say they execute well. Similarly, like my home in China, they kind of execute uh, whatever is uh, very good at execution. So, how would you kind of draw uh, across these areas leadership uh, into creating uh, the right strategies for making uh, social change or bringing it as part of the uh, for all of them? The quick answer and honest answer is easier said than done. <laughs> right? Um, that you have to try. You have to try. So I think as a leader, a lot of the time, um, we have our ideas of what the right policy you know, uh, is. But the word right is in itself a very difficult concept. Because what is right, what is wrong, is almost contextual and also depending on the person, the company, or even the country's core value system. Um, allow me to just digress a little bit, uh, but it's relevant to our topic, you know, which is recently I was reading a book on uh, leadership, wise leadership, based on the Chinese um, philosophers. And uh, what was interesting was that it divided leadership into three types. The first type is the Confucius type of leadership, which emphasizes um, on the humanistic approach. So what is the humanistic approach? That's the approach where you assume that um, men are by nature two. And therefore, I think the Chinese is called it two single right? And therefore, if people are, uh, uh, are uh, by nature two, what we should do is to create the conditions for them and the group to blossom. And that includes moral education and all of these things, you know, from an American age, right? So you rule or you will lead by creating conditions for people to do good and putting in place a set of value system that the society espouses. And then there is a second one, which is the direct opposite, which assumes that all men are evil by nature or bad by nature, right? And various religions also make their assumption, right? Um, and in that approach itself, it's called the legalistic approach. And because it's going to take a long time to educate, the fastest way to get society into order and start doing stuff is really by putting in place law and order, right? So it's fun, right? And then, you know, there is the third approach, which is the law of nature. And the law of nature, of course, I think, as Bill has uh, alluded to earlier, right, it's Tao, right, which is something advocated by Lao Tzu. And the idea is that everything, you know, in life, in uh, Mother Nature itself, has its own timing and uh, flow. And it will swing back when it's in an extreme position. Um, and therefore, what we should allow is to create conditions for things to come around and come full circle. Um, and that's why, you know, in the nature's approach, they advocate Wu Wei, which is the policy of doing, of not interference, but yet Wu Wei should not be seen as doing nothing. It's more like, you know, create the conditions so that, you know, people can take a full circle or a full cycle to experience the ups and downs and to figure what the law of nature uh, is, and of course to, to come to an understanding of that. And I wanted to share this because it got me really thinking about how do we then lead? You know, do most society lead by the legalistic approach, assuming people are not that great to start with, and therefore put in place first the law and orders, so we all behave, or do we lead by the humanistic approach, where we really create conditions to allow people to blossom according to their nature, right? Or should the law of nature be given its space and time to blossom? I try experimenting with all three approaches. 
Singapore is a very interesting blend of humanistic and legalistic approach. We do assume that you know people are good, and that's why in our education system we try to put in place um, correctors, core value system, and so on. But at the same time, in a small country that is desperate to change from third world to first world, and to accelerate that, we also put in place quite a lot of uh, laws and orders, which is why sometimes, especially in the past, Singapore used to be called a fine city. Right? Um, and all of these policies have worked uh, for us um, in a combination and in a state of constant adjustment. So my long answer to your you know, question really is, I think going forward, different countries, just like different companies, will need to have different approaches um, over a period of time. And that approach itself has to also constantly be adjusted to suit the time uh, or the period or the phase of development. So right now, in the case of Singapore, we are trying you know, to go towards the less legalistic, more humanistic kind of approach. And to also, in certain cases, allow things to develop. Um, but the precondition is that the nation needs to stay as one. So for companies, we need, the corporate has to also be aligned, all the employees will have to be quite aligned in order for the full effects or full advantages of some of those policies to come into full flow. So constant state of adjustment um, with a very clear general direction of greater good. That would be my long uh, answer. I think, uh, think having uh, a clear set of guidelines or policies, but be willing to review them and constantly adapt to the changing world. That's that's the more I uh, take, take direction. I was, but I think setting the so it's very important that the right leaders set the direction and then obviously must be flexible enough to adapting to the situation. Thank you. Uh, what do you do? created an unusual platform to get leaders uh, together uh, uh, you know, in your social think tank, so you get exposed to uh, a diverse set of ideas. Uh, so maybe you could kind of uh, uh, tell us in terms of, uh, uh, you know, from an industry point of view, or how has that worked? There? We've discussed about capital markets there. Is there any specific industry which is taking the lead in Hong Kong when it comes to various drive to sustainability? How how have different industries uh, adapted? This is really an interesting question uh, because we come across different industries and they have various um, ESG issues as well. So I think because based on the economic structure, the social structure of Hong Kong, Hong Kong is very much driven by finance and real estate as everyone knows. So it's very much more driven by building or some construction related uh, or land development. This industry is with more concern on ESG. Right. And it's, it's very obvious it's throughout the entire supply chain, you can see that. And, uh, because they need to concern about the environment, and they also need to concern about the social society side, as well as they need to work closely with the government and all the regulatory bodies. So uh, this industry is particularly uh, focusing on ESG. And, there's a lot of policy throughout, uh, and, but that has to be actually initiated by different parts in that supply chain as well. For not just on green building materials, or using really environmental like, uh, materials to, to do it, or use energy saving, uh, doing energy efficiency like solar energy panels, etc. But like, also from, from the entire thing, how you build the building. 
and so also has concern about the social side, like labor side. Like uh, before, it's very there's no such policy for limiting maybe working labor on 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 doing really high rises uh, repairment, for example, they just fall off like, easily without the safety uh, measures implemented. Now they, it becomes compulsory to to have like uh, more more safety measures in it. So uh, from this little details, uh, they're all actually driven by associations in Hong Kong. They they they, they propose this these measures back to the government so that this can be regulated. Right. So it's more in Hong Kong it's more like we're we're self initiated within the industry to improve the situation in ESG. So not only like top down but also sometimes it'll be down top as well. So what so you're an investor, right? So how how what do you uh, how do you kind of Evaluate projects. Uh, number one, and uh, is there? Uh, how do you assess projects? You know, more from an investment, and you know, how you know, obviously you add the uh, sustainability comfort. Sometimes the returns may be delayed, uh, or there. so. How do you uh, measure the uh, returns of your investments? Yeah, that's. Uh why the last question? Because you know, to assess one project, there are many, many steps. But uh, farms limited. I just just uh, say sorry that uh, we base all kind of thing like uh, many MBA course. We teach that uh, how to wrap up one project that we have to base on the feasibility study that include the uh, uh, technical part in engineering, uh, financial model, uh, social safeguard, environmental assess uh, impact assessments. All kind of thing we consider that and must done by must be done by very uh, good consultants and the project owner will review. We have uh, one committee uh, to review, analysis, and give reasons. So that will be a good point uh, to start on developing uh, the projects. Chris, I think you're running out of time. So one last uh, question: uh, You have customers on one side, different. Have investors on the other side. So I think maybe if you could uh, touch upon uh, how do you manage stakeholders? Because obviously at times uh, uh, expectations tend to vary. Uh, so how do you kind of play the balance between uh, what is necessary for the business and what the stakeholders are expecting? Well, I ask this question myself every day. Yeah, it's tough. This is a fine line between being altruistic and also in time we are uh, making a profit and loss, right? So we're all guided by p &L. doesn't matter whether the government or the non-government, right? So, but, but if they don't feel the pain, uh, that means the, the, whether it's shareholders or whether it's customers, uh, they will not adopt this uh, ESG mentality. Right? Again, I, 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 I'm the first line, right? I don't have a government, I, I never sought government help throughout uh, my whole life, uh, even though I'm still born. Uh, and always put on, on my own uh, accord. Uh, I, I didn't do it because my, my choice wanted to do it, because I felt at least the way. It's not just about environmental or social, but also the management. My, but all my partners are, are, are ladies, by the way. I'm the only male in my company. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're very smart. Um, but the, 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 give me one minute, by the way, I'm going to go. So, trying to uh, implement this in my kind of company, I'll be very honest, it's extremely difficult, right? So it's about survival, especially in this time and age. Uh, and I, my company is based in Shanghai, you know, China's not going through the time right now. Uh, I spent, well, it doesn't matter what, what industry it is, but it, there's a lot of success. Uh, the last 14 years, uh, after the Lehman Brothers uh, collapse, there's a lot, a lot of free money, uh, US dollars. Uh, that's the reason why there's so much success that has been on China, whether it's from EV, or it will to the beverage or the finance centers or construction of properties. So I think their pain right now is not uh, focusing on that. Yeah, it's right now it's survival. So I, I think this is a long term thing. And uh, like what uh, Penny said, you have to try. I think the word TRY is so important. You keep trying. And you're going to fail a lot of times. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to fail many, many times before you hit one right. 
uh, not every country has the guidance and the uh, social uh, uh, environment like what Singapore has, uh, unfortunately. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your active participation. Thank you for uh, sharing your ideas. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. And, you know, we have time in cross over, so but if there is one person who has a question, you know, the panelists can take one, otherwise.